Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church weekly Friday Night Live message. And today's topic is, did God change his mind about animals after the flood? So we're going to give people about a minute to, to show up, and then we'll get started. So if you haven't checked out our, our website, it's creationcarechurch.org. And if you go there to the events page, you could find where we're doing book club and what days and times the book club is meeting. And if you go to the, the connect tab, you could find out how to, how to message us, get connected. So we're just going to give people a few more minutes to, to find us. Then we can get started. So the book club kicked off and we did our, our first month of meetings and it's been going well. So if you haven't, it's the book that we're doing is A Faith Embracing All Creatures. It's by Trip York and Andy Alexis Baker. It's a collection of essays about creation care and answering lots of different questions that are uh, concerning animals in the Bible. So it's a really good book. I've already read it. Uh, I recommend it. And being part of the book club, you can be part of the discussion as we go through it. And we meet on a Facebook page. So there's a Creation Care Church Facebook page, which is separate from the Creation Care Church page. So you want to be sure to join that so that you can know what times and stuff like that. All right, so now that we have a few people who joined us, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come together on this, on this Friday night to hear this message, and we just ask that our hearts be open and our minds be open to receive this message and any sort of preconceived notions uh, about what, uh, what, what's going on here with this topic, uh, that we would just put those aside and learn with fresh eyes and a new perspective to hear what your word really says and to really dive into this topic so that we can get a clearer understanding of your character and why this, uh, this situation happened and what can we learn from it. So we just pray for, for you to be with us in this study, and we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So the topic today, did God change his mind about animals after the flood? So the, to kind of contextualize this topic, People often say, okay, yeah, in the beginning, God created the world to, where he told us in Genesis 129, eat the fruit of the tree and the green plants of the ground. That's supposed to be our diet. But then after the flood, God changed his mind and said, well, now animals are on the menu. So anyone who says we should go back to that diet God designed us for with uh, eating the fruit and the vegetation and not the animals, well, they just need to read what what says here in Genesis 8 and 9 about God changing his mind and saying, now I want you to eat animals. So we're going to really look at that and see if that is really what was going on and what we can take away from this information. So I hope this is an enlightening study. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions related to it because it's a big topic. So let's start out with the passage in Genesis 129 that I just mentioned. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. And if you have a Bible, make sure to get your Bible out because we're going to be going through a whole bunch of scripture verses. Not a whole bunch, but several. And it's important to see what your own Bible says, I think. That's my preference, at least. All right, so Genesis 129 says, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. So this is right after God created the world, and he created all the plants, the, the stars, the earth, the seas, all the animals, and then he tells humanity, he says, this is the diet that I want you to eat. I want you to eat fruit and vegetation. That's your food. That's the food that I designed the human body for. So that was his original plan. There's not a whole lot of contention on that topic. The Bible's pretty clear on this. But now we're going to look at a passage in Genesis chapter 9. 
So just to kind of speed things along, basically humanity sins and decides we're going to do things our own way instead of God's way. So then the world gets super wicked and full of corruption and everything we do is evil in God's sight and we're violent. And then the, the world is basically wiped out by a flood except for Noah and his family and a bunch of animals on this ark that God had them build to preserve basically a remnant of the animals and humanity. But then after the floodwaters subside and basically the animals and the people get off the ark, then there's a conversation that takes place between Noah and God. And that's the conversation that we're going to look at now. So it's uh, Genesis 9 verses 2 and 3. So it's Genesis chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 2 and 3. So here it says, and this is God speaking to Noah, And the fear of you and the dread of you will be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives will be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. So it's interesting here that he mentions, he kind of references the, the Garden of Eden when he says, I give you all the, the green plants to eat and the fruit of the trees. So when he says, uh, every moving thing uh, will be food for you, I've given it to you, even as the green herbs. I think that's what he's referencing there. So people read this and they say, well, that's, you know, how can you possibly read this any other way, God's basically changing his mind. And he's saying, just like I gave you the, the green plants in the beginning, well, now I want you to eat animals. But not so fast. Let's look at the context and let's dive a little bit more deeply into what's going on here because it's not quite as straightforward as some make it out to be. So the next scripture verse that I'd like to look at is Genesis 9.16. So a little bit further. Genesis 9, 16, and that says, The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So this covenant that God makes is, he says, I'm never going to destroy the earth again with a flood, like just happened. And he makes this covenant not just with Noah, not just with humanity, but he makes it with every creature, including the animals. And he repeats this, that the animals are part of the covenant five times in chapter nine. So if you read through chapter nine, you'll see uh, that it's mentioned five times and arguably a sixth time, uh, that basically he re keeps reaffirming that my covenant isn't just with humanity, it's also with the animals. So the question, the first question I think to raise is, if what God was doing was just adding animals to the menu, then why is he making a covenant promise with the animals? And why is, he, why is he stressing the importance of the fact that animals are recipients of the covenant? Right? That would be the first thing to ask. Because if his whole plan is, well, now animals are just food items, well, then why is he telling us uh, that these, these food items are our fellow recipients of this covenant promise? Right? So that's the first thing that kind of should alert you that maybe this interpretation is a little off, that God was just changing his mind. So that's the first piece of evidence, but there's more. Uh, but before we get to the other pieces of evidence, I want to mention uh, another alternative reading that uh, I think is plausible. It certainly fits better with the evidence than this idea that God changed his mind. But I think this, this other perspective is lacking in one important way. So the, the alternative reading is that God was making a temporary concession where he's saying there was no, no fruit and vegetation growing on the earth at that point because the flood had wiped it all out. And so he says, temporarily, you can eat animals. But once the fruit and the, the plants grow back, then no more eating animals. So it was a very narrow window of uh, time where he says it's permissible to eat animals. But I don't think this reading works because of Genesis 8, 11. So you, if you look at Genesis chapter 8, 
verse 11, it says, Then the dove came to him, Noah, in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, and Noah knew that the waters had abated from the earth. So basically what was going on here was the floodwaters had subsided, but Noah didn't know yet. And so he's in the ark, and he sends out some birds uh, to, to, to come back and determine whether the floodwaters had subsided so that he knows to get out of the ark. And so whenever this dove comes back with a freshly plucked olive leaf, he knows that the floodwaters have has subsided. And so if that's how he knew that the floodwaters had subsided and that's how he knew to get off the ark, was that the, the bird, this dove, came back with a freshly plucked olive branch or olive leaf, then that means there's olive leaves that are fruiting and olive trees that are growing. So uh, that's why I don't think that this temporary concession alternative reading is exactly correct. Uh, it does make more sense than the view that God's like just adding animals to the menu and, oh, by the way, I'm going to make covenant promises to these menu items. But it's still, I think there's a better reading than, than either of these. That's the one I'm going to suggest right now. So the, the view that I think is the best reading is that God is issuing a warning where he's basically saying, look, you're doing things your own way, you keep doing things your own way, and now here are the consequences of you doing things your own way instead of my way. So God's way is still eat the fruit of the tree and the green plants of the ground, just like he said in the beginning. He's not changing his mind, but he's warning us that basically by doing things our own way instead of God's way, there's going to be consequences. So let's look at Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. So Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. And there it says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord, so this is after he gets off the ark, and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a pleasing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So there's a lot going on in these passages, and in fact, you could probably, I could probably do five different live talks just on these passages right here. So we're going to try to unpack this as much as possible, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to some of these questions in the, the Q&A. For instance, why does it say that there was a pleasing aroma? God was pleased by the aroma? Maybe. And so let's, let's look at, um, let's consider what it says in the middle here. It says, I will, in verse 21, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So let's contrast this with Genesis 131, where when God sees everything that he made, and he says, it is very good. So here, he doesn't say everything is very good. He says, humanity is following their evil imagination. So those are two very different assessments of the state of the world. And so when we, we contrast Genesis 129 of God saying, eat the fruit of the tree and the green plants of the ground, with now what he's saying about the animals being afraid of us and we're going to eat them. So that's also very different. And in fact, the animal fear is more rep reminiscent of Adam and Eve's reaction after the fall, where they hide themselves with the fig leaves and, and hide behind the trees because they're afraid. They're afraid of the punishment for disobeying. So there's a lot going on here that leads me to believe, uh-oh, this isn't God changing his mind and seeing everything's good and, you know, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. It sounds a lot more like he's warning us that we're doing things not his way and that there's all these different consequences, negative consequences uh, as a result of this. So that's the, the evil imagination part, but let's look at the part where it says, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. So what he's referring to there is Genesis 3, 16, and 17. So let's turn there. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And this is where God is responding to Adam when he and his wife disobeyed God and ate from the tree they weren't supposed to eat from. So he says to the, uh, so this is when he's speaking to Eve. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband uh, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam, God said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you saying you shall not eat, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So this is the ground is cursed because humanity is no longer being those, those good stewards of the garden that he created us for, Genesis 2.15, where he says, keep the garden, cultivate it, take care of it, protect it, preserve it. And we're not doing that anymore. We're following our own desires. We're following the deceptions of the serpent, of the enemy. And so that's what he's referencing here. So he's saying, this is how I interpret this. He's saying, look, even though you're, con- even though you're continuing to follow your evil imagination instead of my will, which I told you to do from the beginning is follow my will and be obedient to me because I love you and I'm giving you wisdom. This is the way to act. But instead, we are continuing to follow our own evil imagination. And he's saying, but this time, I'm not going to curse the ground like I did when you first fell into sin from doing things your own way. So he's like, even though you're doing evil still, I'm not going to curse the ground this time. And then if we look at the last part of that verse 21, it says, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So what he's referencing there is Genesis 6.13. So let's look at that. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, this is leading up to the flood. It says, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So basically what's happening here is uh, because we're following sin, following our own evil imaginations instead of God's will, the world gets so bad that we're just full of violence and every inclination of our heart is nothing but evil continually. And so it gets wiped out and restarted with a flood. And so what God's saying here is even though you're continuing in your evil ways and following your own imagination instead of my will, I'm not going to curse the ground again like I did when you first followed your own will instead of my will, nor am I going to destroy the earth again with a flood like I did when it got so bad that there was no other option. So he's, he's not saying, hey, look, everything's great. I'm happy. You know, I see everything's very good. He's saying everything is evil. You're continuing to follow evil, but I have a different plan now. I'm not going to do what I did before of cursing the ground or destroying the earth with a flood. Okay? So I think those are some very important points that people overlook when they just kind of read from Genesis chapter 9 what they want to get out of it. And they're like, oh, well, God added animals to the menu. No, he was making covenant promises to them. And he was saying, we're following our own evil imaginations. And he's saying, I'm going to do something different than I did last time uh, from you following your own evil imagination. One second. So hopefully that, that makes a little bit more sense now. So there's another passage that I would like us to look at. And this is uh, from from Deuteronomy, but before we get there, let me kind of put some, some context here. So let's say, for instance, you're, you're not convinced. You're not convinced that uh, this was God saying everything is evil and these are the consequences of following your evil imagination, that the animals are going to be afraid of you instead of uh, being peaceful and, and loving like I designed them to be, and you're going to eat them instead of eating the diet I designed you for, fruit and vegetation. Let's say you still believe, no, God was giving permission. Like, no matter how you slice it, uh, it's still permission. Even if God doesn't want us to do it, you know, it's still permission. If that's your view, which, of course, is not my view, but if it's your view, 
uh, to even consider what kind of permission that is, I think it's clear from all these verses that, that we already went over here that it's not what God wants. It's not like he's saying, you know what, I don't have a problem with this. Go ahead, uh, eat the animals, no problem. Because otherwise he wouldn't have made the covenant promises with them. He wouldn't have been saying, you know, I'm not going to curse the ground or destroy the earth again. You're still following your evil will. The animals are now living in fear. Fear is not of the Lord. Uh, there's no fear in love. God is love. First uh, John 4, 16 and 18. And so we know that this isn't God changing his mind and God's new plan. This is uh, an evil, corrupt situation that God's responding to. So if you want to say that this is permission, the kind of permission it would be would be similar to the kind of permission that Jesus mentions in Matthew 19, verse 8. So let's look at that. Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. So Matthew 19, verse 8, and this is Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So basically what, he, what he's saying here is he's referencing a, a instruction in Deuteronomy 24.1 where Moses says, uh, you're permitted to divorce your wives as long as you give them a certificate of divorce. And Jesus is responding by saying, well, actually, that's not God's ideal. God's ideal was established in the Garden of Eden when marriage is intended to be an unbreakable bond. And he's saying, because of the hardness of your hearts, uh, there was this, this concession or this permission to do something that is less than God's ideal and God's will. So let's look at those verses that are being referenced here. Let's look at Deuteronomy 24.1. So this is the fifth book of the Old Testament, the last book of the Torah. So Deuteronomy 24.1. It says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. So basically, he's saying, uh, if you divorce your wives, give her a certificate of divorce. And this is supposed to be like an act of mercy that now she has the ability to be remarried, something like that. Uh, but Jesus is saying, look, this isn't God changing his mind and saying, well, actually, I think, you know, divorces, we shove divorces all the time, no problem. Like the ideal, uh, the design, the perfect design is still that marriage is an unbreakable bond. And so he's referencing that original marriage. So let's look at that original marriage. That is, let's see, I believe it's Genesis 2, 24. I love when Jesus mentions the ideal in the Garden of Eden. That's what he's doing here. Genesis 2, 24. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So basically, this is the ideal standard for marriage, where it's now this like unbreakable bond between two individuals. And so uh, to say, well, God changed his mind, and now he's permitting divorce. Well, Jesus specifically says, it's because of the hardness of your heart that it was permitted. So it wasn't God changing his mind, it was that, uh, it was kind of this, uh, this allowance because of um, our, our insistence to not follow his ideal. But the point I'm trying to make there, I'm not trying to make a claim about divorce and marriage and things like that. This is just to, to put into context what it would mean for this to even be read as permission. Because again, I don't read it as permission, I read it as a warning of the consequences of doing things our own way instead of God's way. But even if you, you don't accept that and instead you say, no, it's permission, well, it's not permission of God changing his mind. It would be permission uh, in this sense because, we, because of the hardness of our hearts that we're not willing to live according to the ideal that God designed us for. And that ideal was Genesis 129. So let's look at a couple more scripture verses here. 
So God never changed his mind about divorce, despite conceding permission due to the hardness of your hearts, if that's your reading, which I think is the next best reading behind uh, the one about it just being a warning of the consequences. But let's look at Ezekiel 36, 26. So Ezekiel 36, 26. There it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So Jesus was referencing the hardness of our hearts, where he's saying that's why God made this concession, this permission, even though it falls short of what he, what he desires, what is pleasing to him, that ideal that he designed us for. And so that hardness of heart is represented by the heart of stone. And so he's saying, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to soften your heart instead of having this hard heart uh, that, that resists God's ideal. Instead, he's going to give us a heart of flesh, a softer heart, uh, a heart that will follow God's will and that will have God's laws and his ideal written on our heart. And so that's, that's what we should pray for, for ourselves and for those around us, is that if somebody is adamantly resisting living according to that way God designed us for, that very good way God designed us for in the beginning, and they're trying to come up with reasons for permission, those loopholes like the Pharisees did, uh, finding a loophole in the scripture to withhold mercy, right? Uh, then we should pray that they have a, a softened heart, a heart to do God's will and to live according to that ideal instead of living according to the desires of the flesh and the hard-heartedness. So there's one passage that we go over pretty much every time because it's one of my favorites, and it's fitting. It's kind of closed with this verse. Is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. And there it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So this comes after the previous passages 6, 7, and 8, where he describes the kingdom, the ideal of all the animals lying down safely and at peace with each other. The little child is leading them. And I think it's really important to keep in mind this vision that God has, this purpose for creation because we don't want to fall short of that ideal. We want to live as closely in accordance with that vision and that purpose that God designed everything for. And so when it comes to eating that diet that God originally designed us for in Genesis 129, we want to follow that. We want to, and when we do follow that, what happens with the animals? They're not being killed, they're not being eaten. So they're not going to be living in fear like it says in that passage in Genesis 9 where it says that they'll be afraid of you and you will see them as food. Because we don't want them to be afraid of us. We want to be leading them in the ways of peace and love because that's what God designed us for. That was the dominion that he gave us uh, in Genesis 1.30, where he says, have dominion over all the animals and preserve the garden. And there's no death, there's no killing. So that's the ideal that we want to live in accordance with. And the question of did God change his mind after the flood I think the, the evidence is pretty clear, uh, very clear, that no, he did not change his mind. His mind is still the same, that he wants us to live the way he designed us for before the fall. And if there's any kind of permission or concession that was granted, uh, which is questionable, it might have just been a, a warning of consequences, but even if it was permission, but you're not doing things my way, I want you to be doing things my way but here's, the, here's what's going to happen if you do things your way. And so we don't want to just appeal to permission to do what we want to do. We want to follow God's will and trust in his wisdom to do what's pleasing to God and what God says is best and is very good. So I hope that that was instructive and that you have uh, learned some things. Hopefully you have some questions. So now that we're in this portion... Let's go over some of the questions. So if you have any questions, be sure to ask them in the chat and we will get to them. So 
So the first one, Angel, hey Craig, Douglas Wesco. Hi, uh, Paula, hi Craig, hi Paula, thanks for joining us. Uh, Steven, smiley face, thanks for joining us. Let's see, Paula, Craig, I was told when God says, uh, shall it's a commandment, is that true? So basically the, the question is the word shall. In Hebrew, there is no word for shall. And so a translator would have to decide, is it will, is it shall? And that's the what's known as the it, uh, I'm sorry, is ought distinction. And so the, is he saying, well, it is this way, or is he saying it ought to be this way? So for instance, the Ten Commandments, thou shall worship God alone, thou shall not murder, thou shall not steal. Those are pretty clear moral directives where it's saying ought, so he's saying, you ought not do these things. I'm commanding you not to do them. Whereas in a lot of other cases where it's like, this will happen, uh, instead of saying it shall or I, it ought to happen. So that word shall is a little archaic uh, it, because it's, it's not clear in English whether it's describing is or ought or will or ought. So again, it's uh, if your Bible says, you know, you shall do this, uh, it's not always clear whether that's a, a moral directive or not. Good question. In the beginning, didn't God give humans only seed-bearing fruits? Yeah, so in the beginning, when he gave us this diet, uh, I think there's some important things to, to consider. Genesis 129. Right after he does that, he, he says, or right before that, he gives us dominion over the animals. And then he says, now don't eat the animals, basically. So whatever is contained within that scope of things that are acceptable for us to eat, it's clear that animals are outside of that scope. So animals are not uh, fruit bearing, or I'm sorry, seed bearing fruit, and they're not green herb of the ground. So it's clear that animals and their products, whether it's their milk or their eggs or their honey, whatever it is, those things are not within the, the scope of the diet that, that God is giving us in the beginning. Now, whether that means we should be raw fruitarians or vegans is unclear because an interesting thing to, to note is that if you are a raw fruitarian and you only eat the, the fruit of the tree and then the, the herbs of the ground, so let's say basil, rosemary, things like that. Well, when you prune uh, a bush, let's say a, a basil bush, then basically you're, you're cutting off the flowering part and that allows it to continue to grow. Whereas if you don't cut off the flowering part and you allow it to flower, then it'll die because the flowering cycle is the final cycle of the plant. And so you're actually doing the, the plant a service by cutting off the flowering portion, by keeping the plant alive. And so then if you eat that portion, you're not harming the plant, you're actually helping. It's a symbiotic relationship. And with fruit, uh, you eat the fruit and then you digest the seed. The seed survives your digestive tract and then you expel it um, and then you bury that uh, the poop, and basically that's a fertile environment for that seed to grow into a new tree. So you're assisting in the reproductive cycle of the tree when you eat the tree's fruit. So again, that's a symbiotic relationship. There is no the plants aren't dying. You're keeping them alive, and you're uh, you're perpetuating their reproductive life cycle. So that might be the ideal. And in fact, if anyone says, hey, what advice would you give me for the perfect way to live and eat in the world? I would say, well, the perfect ideal, I think, is to be a raw fruitarian and eating just uh, the green herbs and the fruit of the tree that yields seed. But I think the next best thing would be to be vegan because then you're at least not eating the animals. And I think that distinction between eating animals and not eating animals is a huge one because animals weren't created to just be menu items. They were created to live joyfully and peacefully as someone's alongside us in this world. And so that, I would say, would be a huge jump is to go from 
eating animals and their products to not eating them. And then if you wanted to continue to grow and continue to get closer to that ideal, I would say move toward being raw fruitarian. Okay, next question. I had a thought that later he gave us all the vegetation and it fits better with Genesis 9.4. Okay. So you're saying basically first he gave us the, the fruit of the tree that yields seed and the, the green herbs of the ground, and now he's giving us all vegetation. Uh, that's possible. Let's see, Genesis 9, 4. Let's look at that. Genesis 9, 4. Uh, but you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. Okay, so I think you're referring to Genesis 9, 3. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. Yeah, so uh, again, it's kind of like he's he's saying, hey, look, don't eat the blood. Well, you can't eat flesh without consuming some amount of blood. And so the only way to really do that fully is to not eat flesh at all, to abstain from blood. Um, but yeah, I haven't heard that, that reading, and I'm not sure how we could exactly get that from the text, because it says, giving you all things even as the green herbs. So it doesn't seem like he's introducing any kind of new vegetation. The only thing that is being introduced here is the animals. But then, as we mentioned with all the verses we went over tonight, uh, it does not seem like he is just adding animals because he's like, hey, look, guys, more menu items. So I'd be interested to hear more evidence if you have more evidence that he's giving us more vegetables or something. But I think that my understanding of this passage is just that uh, the animals are the the question. So it seems like I'm, I'm only seeing Paula's comments for some reason. I know that I saw some other people comment, but I'm not seeing them. Let's see. But God could feed them manna as he did in the wilderness instead of hurting animals. Just like Numbers 11, 7 through 9 and Exodus 16. Yeah, so I, I think this is referring to the, the part where if they're, let's say, the, the alternate reading where God is making a temporary concession to eat animals, well, he could have just given them manna to eat. Or whatever provisions were inside the ark, he could have just multiplied those provisions to continue to last until the, the fruit and the vegetation grows back, right? So I, I don't, again, that's kind of more evidence to suggest that there, there's really no reason for there being a temporary concession. And I think that the evidence of the the dove returning with a freshly plucked olive leaf is enough evidence for me to kind of think that that's not the best reading of what's happening. I think the best reading is that uh, he was warning of the consequences of what was happening and following our own evil imagination. So let's see. Oh, here we go, more questions. Still trying to figure out the technology, so bear with me. Let's see. Restricting and making it difficult. If God meant the drain of the blood, he would have said drain the blood, and he didn't say drain the blood because it really isn't possible. It sounds like he meant don't eat the animals because you can't eat live animals. Yeah, I think God does this sometimes where... Uh, he, he's dealing with, you have to keep in mind, he's dealing with a stubborn, rebellious people throughout Scripture. And he's not dealing with these obedient people who are like, God, I will do everything you say, just tell me what you want, and they do it. He's dealing with people who are constantly not doing his will and not doing what he says to do. And so he's constantly trying to meet us where we are and save us. So it's all about saving us uh, from the stranglehold that sin has over our lives. And so when he says things like, do not eat the blood, then, okay, well, some might say, oh, well, good. At least now I can eat the animals. I just have to drain the blood out. But then when you really think more deeply on it, you realize, wait, that's not possible. So if you really want to do God's will, then you just do what he said to do in the beginning. 
right, which was to not eat the animals at all. But that, that progression, that, that building of our faith, that building of our trust in God's wisdom and in his plan, and in those original instructions he gave us, uh, that's a process. And by somebody, let's say, draining all the blood out of the animal and then slowly coming to realize, wait, I'm still consuming some blood, and then they stop eating the animals, uh, that can be kind of a, it's almost like a, a crutch to get us from totally being steeped in what God doesn't want us to do to getting us to that ideal that he really wants us to be at. And it's like a way to kind of transition to it. So I think there's a lot of wisdom in, in God's approach. I see this happen a lot, you know, for instance, with someone who's doing vegan outreach, where they say, where they're talking to someone and the person says, oh, no, 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 I can never be vegan. I, I can never give up cheese. I can never give up hamburgers or whatever it is. And so they'll say, okay, well, if you're not open to being completely vegan and not eating animal products anymore, how about you start by cutting out everything except the cheese, everything except the hamburgers? And then the person's like, oh, well, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can give up some things but not everything. And so we see God doing that too with the, the draining of the blood and with like the clean, unclean animals distinction where he's just so merciful and so compassionate and loves us so much that he, uh, he's not going to give up on us even when we're refusing to do his will. And so he gives us these directives to guide us toward what is best. So there's another question. So if we look at Genesis chapter 8, Let's see, Genesis chapter 8, and let's look at verse 21 again. So it says, And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma, or a pleasing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. And so this is his response to the previous verse in 20, where it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So this is the first time in scripture where an altar is mentioned. And it's also the first explicit mention of a burnt offering. So some believe that uh, Abel offered a burnt offering uh, but that's questionable, and that's another uh, live talk that we have planned for the for the future. But this is the first explicit mention of that word and of an altar. And so God responding to this, there's that verse where it says, or that portion of the verse where it says, God smelled the pleasing aroma. And so the question is, well, God was pleased by it, right? And so if God's pleased by the aroma, and he's like, oh, that smells so good, that burning animal. You know what? I'm not going to curse you, and I'm not going to destroy the earth anymore because I'm so pleased by the smell of this, this burning animal. So that kind of gets people to think, well, how can you read this another way? It says God was pleased by the offering. But does it? It actually says God smelled the pleasing aroma. It doesn't say God was pleased by the aroma. And in fact, there's a couple of verses I want to I wanna share with you that offer a different view of what's going on here. So let's look at Ezekiel 6.13. Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 13. It says, Then you shall know that I am the Lord, when their slain men are among their idols, all around their altars, on every high hill, on all the mountaintops, under every green tree, and under every thick oak, wherever they offered pleasing aroma to all their idols. So it's saying here that, they're, that these are people who are worshiping idols and pagan gods. And they're saying, you're offering these pleasing aroma to your idols. That's what it's saying here in this passage. So if the pleasing aroma is pleasing to the recipient of the offering, then that would mean that the idols are the ones who are pleased 
by the aroma of the offering. So that's the, the interpretation that somebody's making of that passage in Genesis 8.21, is that the recipient, God, is pleased by the aroma, the offering. Uh, but if we're going, it's the same parallel language here, the same terminology and phrase that's used when it says the idols are offered the pleasing aroma. But then if we look at Psalm 115, that's Psalm 115, 115th Psalm, and verse 4 through 6. So Psalm 115, 4 through 6 says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but cannot smell. Uh, they have hands. So basically he's saying these wooden idols, these statues that they, that they construct and worship uh, and offer all these burnt offerings and and things like that to these, these idols. It says you carve a nose, but that nose cannot smell because it's just an inert block of wood. It's not a being. It's not like God who's someone. This is just a block of wood that we're pretending is, is a God. And so if idols cannot smell, then idols cannot be pleased by an aroma. And so if these pagans, uh, these people who are worshiping idols, are offering pleasing aroma to the idols who cannot smell and cannot be pleased by an aroma, well, that means that they're not pleasing to the recipient. They're pleasing to someone else, right? And I think it, it means that it's pleasing to the flesh. It's like if we consider the, the fall, the original temptation, Genesis 3, where Eve, let's see, where is it? Uh... It says chapter 3, verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, uh, We cannot you know, eat the fruit. 3, But if the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden of God, we shall not touch it. And the serpent says, Surely you won't die. And then in 6, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasing to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband, and he ate. So again, pleasing to the eyes. Well, Pleasing to the senses, pleasing to the eyes. Uh, what's pleasing aroma? Pleasing to the nose, to the senses. So we're following our sense pleasures instead of following God's instructions. And so this pleasing aroma isn't pleasing to God, just like the pleasing aroma can't be pleasing to the idols that the idol worshipers are offering. So I don't think that this is pleasing to God. I think it's pleasing to our own senses. A good question. So let's see, next question. I think God does give us over to certain things that are not his ideal because of the hardness of our hearts, as Craig mentioned, like with divorce. There is much evil in this world that God does not stop, sadly, because, God, because people are stubbornly following their own ways. But of course, this is all temporary. That's the good news. Yes, that's definitely the good news. See, Matthew, thank you for joining us. I agree that was kosher law. Uh, the kosher laws were meant to make meat eating more difficult. Yeah, that's really, that's an interesting observation because if you think about it, there's so many restrictions around what it's, what's required to actually eat animal flesh. It has to be a clean animal. The blood has to be drained out. It can't be cooked on the same equipment that was used to cook any unclean animals or anything unclean. And there's like all these restrictions that go into uh, what's necessary just to eat animal flesh. And so if we just eat plants instead, then there's like no restrictions at all. And so it does, it is like way more difficult. And then if you really dive into it with the blood restriction, it might not even be possible. Right. I, I'm still not, I'm not sure what's going on, but I don't think I can see all the comments. Let's see, 26 comments, but can only read four. Right. Okay, another question is, 
It says that God blessed Noah. So Genesis 9, chapter 1, it says, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So the question would be, well, why did God bless Noah if he wasn't pleased by this, by this offering and he wasn't changing his mind and saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to add anim animals to the menu. Well, good question. And fortunately, there's a very easy answer to this question of why God blessed Noah. And the short answer is God promised he would do it and God keeps his promises. So even though uh, Noah presumably was following his own evil imagination, doing things his own way, without God instructing him to do these things after he gets off the ark, uh, God still is a keeper of his promises. So let's look at Genesis 6.18. So Genesis 6.18, this is uh, leading up to the flood, and God's speaking to Noah, and he says, uh, even though I'm going to destroy the, the earth, I'm going to preserve you and all aboard the ark. And he says, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. So he's basically saying, he, he says, I want you to get in this ark, and I am promising that I am going to make a covenant with you uh, when you get out, when you're saved from this flood. And so God said, I am going to establish this covenant with you and bless you. And so then in Genesis 9-1, after they get off the ark, it says, so God blessed Noah and his sons. And he says, be fruitful and multiply and uh, fill the earth. Exactly the instructions he gave to animals and to people uh, in the beginning when he created the, the earth. So it's not that God was pleased by this aroma and he's like, you know what, I'm going to make a covenant with you because I'm so pleased by this burning animal flesh. Uh, instead, he's saying, I'm still going to fulfill my covenant because I promised I was going to make this covenant with you and I keep my promises. And so he blesses us despite us following our own evil imagination instead of his will, not because of it. Hopefully that answered the question. Well, this is the most questions we've had so far. It's going to take us a lifetime, I bet, to address them all. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how to work with this technology. Let's see if I can see it on the other monitor. What do you make of St. Jerome's view? This is Philip. Thanks for joining us. Uh, seems a bit harsh. The eating of flesh was unknown until the deluge or the flood, but after the deluge, like the quails given in the desert to the murmuring people, the poison of flesh meat was offered to our teeth. Right, so he's he's meant he's referencing Numbers chapter eleven, where basically the Israelites uh, they're craving the meat of their slavery in Egypt. And they're like, give us meat to eat. Why did we even follow you out into this desert, uh, Moses? We would be better off in slavery where we could eat meat. And so they're grumbling, and Moses is like, what do I do, Lord? They're so mad they want to kill me because they're, they're craving meat. And so basically God says, all right, prepare yourselves. I'm going to give you quail. And so God sends all these quail, and they kill them. And they, while, they, while it's still in their teeth, the flesh of this quail, it says they're struck with the great plague and many of them die. And it, that place is called the grave of craving because many people died because of their craving. They weren't satisfied with the manna that God was giving them. They wanted this, this meat. And so basically the, the view here that's being attributed to Jerome is that basically it's a similar thing going on where we're refusing to be satisfied with the diet that God gave us. Uh, which was Genesis 129. And so God gives us basically now this, this other alternative, but this other alternative comes with all these negative consequences. The animals are afraid. Um, uh, there's 
the world's full of violence and bloodshed and all kinds of other things. And if we, if we think today, if we look around at what's happening in the world, uh, eating animal flesh and animal products is so prevalent. It's the norm almost everywhere in the world. And what do we see? We see high prevalences of diseases that are preventable, that are directly related to consuming animal products. Uh, various kinds of cancers and strokes and heart attacks and high blood pressure and uh, all kinds of things. And then we see when people switch to an entirely whole food, plant-based diet, we see a lot of these diseases being reversed within the matter of months in their life. So if you haven't, check out PCRM, that's Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Uh, they have all kinds of information about the health benefits of switching to whole foods, plant-based diets, and lots and lots and lots of testimonies from professionals in all kinds of medical fields, uh, just sharing just miraculous kind of research for people going back to this diet that God gave us and how the, the health transformations that result from it. So yeah, there's like, there's so much wisdom even today in following that original diet that God gave us that uh, you could transform your own health uh, by doing it. And, and it's not necessarily going to solve all your problems, but it's certainly going to put you in a better position. Most people, 99% of people. So good point. So another question, what do you make of Matthew Henry's take on the Genesis 9-2 passage? The grant of the animals for food fully warrants the use of them, but not the abuse of them by gluttony, still less cruelty by cruelty. We ought not to pain them needlessly while they live, nor when we take away their lives. So this is kind of the uh, humane slaughter argument that I often hear. And they say, well, it's better to like give an animal a good life and then take the life of the animal. But really there's so much going on there because if you can just not eat the animal at all, like don't kill the animal. The animal wants to live. The animal wants to be joyful. The animal wants to raise children. The animal wants to be free. Like why take that away? I mean, sure, it's better to, you know, not beat the animal and torture the animal before you kill the animal. But it's even better than that to not kill the animal at all. It's better to just trust God's original wisdom and just say, you know what, I'm not going to eat animals anymore. I'm just going to eat fruit and vegetation. I'm going to live a vegan lifestyle. I'm going to do this because that's how God designed me to be. And I don't want to harm God's creation. I want to follow God and his trust in his wisdom and why he designed me. So uh, is it better? Uh, sure, a little bit better, but I don't think that it's necessary to, I mean, like, it's all gluttony, you know? It's like, why are you eating animal products when you don't have to, right? And so I just think it, it's, we should always strive for what's best. We should always strive for what God says is, is very good. So I wish I could see some of the comments. I'll try to figure out this technology and maybe get to uh, maybe have a moderator or something. If you'd like to be a moderator, sign up. <laughs> but anyway, we're about out of time. So I'll have to get to all these comments, uh, the rest of the comments in the, the thread afterwards. So uh, still continue to ask your questions. We'll just have to address them uh, through text instead of on the, the live stream. But thank you for joining us this week. Uh, join us next week where we're starting a series. And this is going to be a series on uh, the Old Testament, specifically animal sacrifice. So we're going to start by talking about why did God instruct animal sacrifices? And then we're going to talk about uh, will this temple practice of animal sacrifices ever come back? And then we'll talk about various other topics that are related to that, those questions. So be sure to join us for those. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Loving God, thank you so much for just giving us your word so that we can just come and uh, just learn more about your will and that we don't have to rely on what the world tells us, uh, that we don't have to figure things out on our own, but we could just trust in you and your wisdom and that 
your wisdom never changes, that you, you're the same today as you were yesterday, and that you'll be the same tomorrow. We just thank you for being a God whose nature is love, and that you, you call us to, to salvation. You come to save us. And if there's anyone who's hearing this message who, who hasn't received that salvation in their lives and, and who wants to, to live their life as part of the solution, the solution that only comes through being a member of the body of Jesus Christ, just we have a, uh, if you would just join us in our uh, connect on our, on our website, there's a link where we can connect you with someone to, who can pray for you and uh, just lead you into the knowledge of what salvation is all about. We just thank you for, for being a God who loves us and who is willing to save us and willing to, to deal with us in our, in our trespasses and revive and restore this fallen world. We thank you for being a God whose word will not return void and your will will not be thwarted, that no matter what the enemy does, no matter what we do uh, that work, works against your plan, just that your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven and that it's already been declared and that that victory over death and sin has already been won, and it's only a matter of when you restore your kingdom and bring us back to life. So we just thank you for, for all of this, and we, we thank you for being a God who loves us. So uh, we just pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So again, thank you for joining us, and I hope you join us again next week. God bless.